So it's five past 12, and uh, we started this new <clears throat> EMCDDA webinar. Um, this time we will talk about drug use and um, working place. The chair of the, this webinar will be Ines Asselberg, our colleague, and I immediately give her the floor to start. Ines, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marika. Now, uh, before giving the floor to our speakers, I would like to say a few words about the context of the seminar. Um, Ale, can you put the slides? Perhaps the next one I will introduce the speakers uh, afterwards, it might be easier. Okay, so earlier this year, we have launched a mini guide on health and social responses to drug related problems in the workplace. And it is this mini guide that it's the backdrop of the seminar. Now the speakers we invited here today will provide you with a general overview of the main issues and of the future challenge, challenges, but they will also share their experience and knowledge on some specific cases. So I'm not really going to attempt here to summarize the contents of our mini guide, but just to tell you a little bit about it. Um, next one. Thank you. So the mini guide is part of a larger set of mini guides that together form the health and social responses to drug problems, a European guide. This is a free resource, fully digital, and you can find it very easily on our website. And it's very easy to navigate between the different components of the guide. Now this guide, what it does is that it looks at key public health challenges in the drugs field today. And then we try to provide practical advice for practitioners and policy makers who are in the process of designing and targeting and implementing responses to these problems. The guide is composed of four sets of mini guides that you see here, patterns of drug use, vulnerable groups, et cetera, uh, looking from a different perspective to the problems. Um, click, yes. So an important factor that can influence drug use, the problems that may be associated with drug use and the selection of appropriate responses is the setting in which use of course, of course. We have launched five mini guides addressing different settings. So local communities, prisons, schools, recreational settings, and of course the workplace. Now, why is workplace an important setting? The workplace is an important setting to consider, and this is why we've included it in the guide, for several reasons. So perhaps the most obvious that we always think about is safety. So bus drivers or people operating heavy machinery, et cetera, may pose a risk to themselves or to others if they are intoxicated while working. But accidents and injuries apart, drug use may also increase absenteeism or inappropriate behavior at a workplace. It can impose an economic burden on employees, the government and society. It is also important to consider workplaces because it might be the actual circumstances of the work that are leading to drug use. And this could be because of very tough working conditions or low satisfaction of work or irregular work hours or coping with shift work, et cetera. We also need to remember that workplaces provide an opportunity for health education and promotion about alcohol and drug use. And they also provide an opportunity to identify individuals who have problems with alcohol and drug use or who have family members dealing with these problems. Again, here it's important to remember that employees, employers have a duty under health and safety laws to protect the health, safety and welfare of their employees. Finally, the workplace also has a potential role in supporting the social integration of people with a history of drug problems. So, what can you find in this mini guide? Thank you, Ale. In this mini guide, we provide an overview of what to consider when planning or delivering health and social responses to drug related problems in the workplace. We review the available interventions and what we know about their effectiveness. And we also talk about what we know is happening in Europe. We consider some of the implications for policy and practice. We provide available data and graphics, which in this case are actually coming from EU OSHA and their survey. And we provide lists of other relevant resources. 
Now, together with the Workplace Mini Guide, we also launched a spotlight on performance and image enhancement drugs. Uh, so these substances are substances that have the perceived potential to improve human traits. And along with, with other human enhancement drugs, they are becoming a challenge to drug use or to responding in responding to drug use in the workplace. The spotlights are a different product than the mini guide. And we use these spotlights in the general guide when we want to look at issues that are cross cutting to the different components and the different elements of the guide. Now they're really awesome because they're very short text and they're very to the point. So in this one, for instance, we will tell you what are performance and image enhancement drugs? What is happening in Europe? What problems are associated with their use? How we can respond to them? And what are the implications for the future? Now, again, here, I'm not going to dwell on these substances as our colleagues from EU Washa will be talking soon about these and other human enhancement drugs. So in short, we invite you to have a look at this mini guide and to our other resources, which you can find very easily at our webpage at www dot emcdda.europa.com. If you are interested, you can also stay informed about updates and news by subscribing to our, our mailing list newsletter. I will put the, the link in the chat very soon because it's easier to, to then just click if you're interested. And with no further ado, I will introduce you to our speakers today. The, sp the first speakers we have that are going to talk, it's William Cockburn and Anik Staden, both from EU Washa, that is the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work. William is currently the Interim Executive Director of EU Washa. He was in charge of the Prevention and Research Unit and was responsible for the first European survey of enterprises on new and emerging risks, on which data we actually draw on for the mini guide. William also contributed to the development of this mini guide in his role as external reviewer, for which we are very thankful. Anik is a project manager at EU Washa's Prevention and Research Unit. She is responsible for the Foresight Project, which, if I'm not mistaken, has published a few articles on the use of uh, human enhancement drugs. So we'll go to the, oh, sorry, I'm forgetting about the other speakers. I was just going to run into the next question. After William and Anik, we will hear from Johan Sorsen, a researcher at the School of Culture and Society at Aarhus University in Denmark. Johan has worked extensively on substance use and risk management in different recreational settings. She has also worked and is, keeps on working in collaborative health IT development projects. And most importantly for this webinar, Johanna has conducted research on doctors' use of drugs and alcohol in the work environment. And then last but not least, we will hear from Elisabeth Santos. Elisabeth is a clinical psychologist. She has worked for over a decade at the Portuguese National Agency for Drugs and Drugs Addiction. And currently she works in the healthcare unit of a large Portuguese company. She has been very involved in the development of a workplace drug and alcohol prevention program of which she'll, she will tell us more during the webinar. Yes, so question number one for William and Anik. What are the most pressing challenges right now in Europe? And what are the implications for policy and practice? Okay. Um, yes, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And it's really a great opportunity. I think I'll speak for William and me to be here and uh, put this, uh, this topic on the spotlight. Uh, we've been working on it and it's really, really great to make the link, to make the bridge uh, between uh, the topic of, uh, of the use of drug and substances and to put this in the context of the working place. So um, yes, occupational safety and health, safety, health, uh, work health, uh, workplace health promotion and trends and challenges. These are the four perspectives from which uh, we would like to uh, uh, look at this uh, topic of uh, drug use. So I will start with uh, the safety and health perspective and then William will uh, take over and continue with the workplace health promotion and the ongoing interesting trends and challenges that we have in this field. 
So next slide, please. Safety. Yes, you uh, told us already a bit in your um, in your introduction. Uh, the use of drugs uh, is, I uh, think, an old, quite conventional problem. Alcohol, drugs, in especially safety crit critical occupations. When you think of of drugs in the workplace, yeah, you don't want to have uh, uh, a bus driver or a pilot. I think we even have uh, stories or narratives like this in the past of. Uh, of uh, um, people who were in their work position uh, and may or did use drugs and, and so got into a critical in incident. This is not what we have. There's also in the high risk in, in the high risk industry, you see um, uh, it's very, very important. And here I think it's more normal to see also drug testing in a more structural way. Um, so that may be uh, to the second point, drug testing, drug testing of workers. Well, uh, I think here in Europe, we have a more restrictive approach uh, compared with, for example, in the, in the US. And here you see mostly that if there's drug testing in one place, that's because something already has uh, happened in the past. So there is already kind of a biased world and uh, there's so uh, random testings. Um, still, there are a lot of um, issues going on and it's very different as you also uh, uh, described in, in, in your overview between uh, countries. And there are some issues uh, open, for example, uh, related to occupational injury compensation. Um, uh, what happens if somebody is uh, involved in an accident at work and, and it goes wrong? Uh, uh, then we have all these societal attitudes that uh, differ between sectors, between working places and we're all social partners in advance. What's the awareness? What is the what is the mindset regarding this issue? This can really change between sectors, co companies and countries. Um, there are guidance and workplaces in, in place, but what does help, what does not help? There's a very little evidence related to interventions. And, and that was what you're already aiming at. I think that's really interesting. That's the growing and the different type of drugs and substances used in the workplace. For that, in our foresight study, we already published two articles on performance enhancing drugs, what's their prevalence, if you can say anything about it, and how can you manage it? And uh, next slide, please. For example, how you see this broad range of substances for enhancement, uh, and micro doses on LSD for creativity, uh, uh, and uh, that is especially used in more in the creative industry, for example, in software development or in, uh, in game uh, development. And then next slide, please. The next slide, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. So, um, uh, yes, that's a really interesting development that you, that brings me to the topic of health, because of course this health perspective is is, is very um, interesting to to take into account here, here when uh, preventing it. For example, exposure to combinations of substances. Uh, what? How does it? Uh, uh, increase maybe our uh, influence sensibility when it's used together with uh, carcinogens, skin sensitizers, asthmagens, or yeah, other other uh, substances, substances that are already used for uh, hairdressers, beauticians, farmers, builders, and in healthcare workers. And also, what's the impact on the use of uh, PPEs on personal protective e equipment? Um, related to performance enhancements, um, you see now as an example, uh, stamina alertness, uh, that's it used for, so you see uh, cocaine, amphetamines, um, that are mostly used by long distance drivers and financial tracers, and then you see uh, for performance enhancement, the memory and the concentration activators, for example, the Ritalin, for the, that's quite normal uh, to use for the students, uh, populations like the modafinil for the ADHD uh, um, uh, support. And then we have the imagination creators, the inspiration creators like LSD microdoses. That is what you mostly see on designers and programmers. That's kind of an overview of what we see that is happening more and more. And what is the issue here? There's no data. There's really minimal, minimal data. There's little understanding of long-term health effects. And then, um, uh, related to social attitudes, you see it's getting more and more normal because you have this availability, you have internet pharmacists, uh, you have the use of the smart drugs really related, really seen 
in the media as if it's like really normal. And then um, the acceptance of recreational use, we can see that uh, when recreational use of drugs is, uh, is normal, then also the step to uh, drugs in the workplace is, uh, is seen as more normal and normal. Also among supervisors, uh, there is some first proof. So when um, you are trying to improve your mental function, it seems like that is okay. Well, there's so little known about the side effects. So it's really hard to, um, to get this mindset um, to get a change because it feels okay. And I think, and we think this normalization of the issue is really an issue. Um, and it's interesting to look at this working context and where are the trigger factors um, in this working context to get this normalization uh, not so normal anymore. So now I would like to um, give over the floor to William. Oh, this is another example of the type of drugs that's now growing and growing. Thanks, Annick, and uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, maybe we can move to the next slide and I'll say a few words about um, workplace health promotion. Um, there's health surveillance in the workplace, uh, the role of occupational doctors, um, as well as the workplace being uh, a fantastic opportunity, a venue, for for promoting uh, health benefiting behaviors and this is this is picked up in your in your guidelines uh very well so the workplace is a setting for for changing behavior in terms of health um, occupational health is also uh, able to provide a link to to primary care and and this is about treating uh, a drug problem as you would any other health problem uh, avoiding stigmatization and and a lot of this comes across in the ilo key principles. Uh, so you would then establish links with, uh, with the general practitioner and uh, then advise the employer on appropriate adaptations uh, in the organization of work, for example, in the tasks and duties. Um, there's a strong link, of course, between drug use and, and psychosocial risks and psychosocial health, mental health. Uh, on the one hand, if you're a, a, a drug user, you're more likely to, to develop mental health problems, have psychological problems. But on the other hand, drug use itself uh, is an important red flag. It's an important signal to an employer that there may well be issues at work that are prompting uh, the use of drugs as a, as a coping mechanism, whether that's uh, for adverse relationships, uh, to deal with the stress, uh, have a high workload, work intensity, um, and so this is something that needs to be uh, to be addressed from an occupational organizational um, perspective. There's also a link between occupational injury uh, and drug use. And uh, a recent survey in Canada by the Institute for Work and Health, where cannabis has been legalized in 2018, uh, they saw that uh, the injury rate uh, was doubled for those who used drugs at the workplace. Um, but at the same time, they also found that 16% of those who use cannabis in the workplace are doing so to, to manage the pain uh, from a, from a work-related uh, injury or, or illness. So it's, uh, if you like, it's a two-way uh, two street. Um, just as an anecdote, I think in, in the US, there's a strong link between the, the opioid ep epidemic and working conditions there, many people were prescribed uh, opioid painkillers uh, to deal with uh, injuries uh, that they'd got in, in heavy industry. Uh, and, and that introduction then not only made the, uh, the injured person more uh, likely to, to develop an addiction, but also uh, family members in the household who had easier access to those drugs. So, so there's a strong occupational uh, link if we can move to the next slide, um, I can mention the uh, survey that we carried out interviewing uh, those responsible for health and safety in around 50,000 enterprises in Europe. And, and we asked them about whether they provide uh, health promotion interventions on, on addiction to, uh, to alcohol and, uh, and drugs. And we can see here in this map the, the distribution, uh, there's, I should say that we carried out this survey in 2014 and 19, and we'll do so again in 24. And there's been not much change uh, year on year. Um, it ranges from 58% uh, of enterprises 
in Finland to 21% in Estonia. So big variations across Europe. Larger enterprises are, are much more likely to have um, uh, these interventions in place. Uh, and also those enterprises that are in education, in health, or the social care services. So, 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 so quite, um, quite different from one, from one area to, to another. If we go to the next slide, just to summarize some of the trends and challenges that we see from, uh, from our perspective. Uh, one is the extent of drug use in the working population. What will be the impact of legislation? The study I mentioned in Canada indicated that the prevalence of drug use in the workplace did not change. It stayed constant at around, um, around 12%. What there was was a very big increase in the proportion of workplaces that had uh, a policy on, on drug and alcohol use in place. It changed from 63 to 79%, so quite a, quite a positive uh, impact in that sense. And also the uh, Canadian Standards Association uh, is working to develop a standard on measuring impairment in the workplace, which is a, a, a very big challenge when trying to control drug use in the workplace. I've mentioned psychosocial risks. Um, from our research, we see that these are uh, an ever increasing problem. So that will raise the issue of whether uh, drugs are increasingly used to cope with those psychosocial risks or whether increasing drug use will lead to more psychosocial risks. And this is an area that employers find especially difficult to, to, to manage. So uh, there's, a, there's a need here for, for practical guidelines like the ones that, that, that you have uh, issued at EMCDDA. Um, the aging of the working population is also a factor that we think needs to be uh, taken into account. Um, just because drug use currently is amongst younger uh, age cohorts, does that mean that people leave and change their habits as they get older, or will they be carrying those habits as a generation uh, as they get older? Perhaps as we get older, uh, people will be turning to performance enhancing uh, drugs to, to compensate for, for the deficiencies that inevitably come with getting, with getting older. The research we're doing at EUOSHA also highlights challenges from digitalization. We're seeing artificial intelligence used more and more for managing workers, monitoring workers, we're seeing greater automation. These are changing the demands on workers. Perhaps here again, it'll be a, a driver or, or perhaps even uh, uh, reducing uh, drug use in the workplace. Um, again, lots of changes happening and um, it's essential that we keep these collaborations going and the information and research carried out so that we know how best to respond. And the next slide is just to thank you for your attention and to thank EMCDDA for inviting us to this uh, workshop and giving us the opportunity to comment on the excellent guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, William and Anik. This was a, a wonderful presentation and I think it gave a very good overview of, of the issues um, at hand. I would like to, to say to everyone attending that we will have a question and answer sessions at the end of the presentations. In the meantime, feel free to put in your questions at the question and answers button. This is right next in the bottom line, right next to the chat button. Um, and I will now give the floor to Johanna for answering our question, what do we know about substance use in the workplace? And I believe she is going to present us with a case study from Denmark based on her own research. Johanna? Yes, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and thank you for the nice introduction also. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research on substance use disorders in uh, physician workplaces in Denmark. And uh, I use the ICD-10 definitions of substance use disorders and dependency uh, syndromes. Uh, please change slide. So these are, are the outputs uh, of my survey among uh, 4,000 Danish physicians um, in 2014. And uh, we had a response rate of uh, 48 uh, percent. Please change slide. I will tell you just a few uh, findings uh, from the study. And uh, 
the quantitative articles uh, showed that 19% of the physicians had a problematic consumption of alcohol and only 23% of these physicians actually recognized that they had a problematic alcohol consumption. Significantly more of the men than women uh, had a, a problematic consumption of alcohol and only 3% of the whole population uh, in the study um, thought that there was an openness about uh, substance use disorders at the workplaces. Please change. Yes, and this is a, an article also from the same study, but this is a qualitative uh, article. Uh, and please change slide, then I will tell a little. Um, the title was how uh, physicians uh, professional socialization and social technologies may affect colleagues in substance use disorders. My targeted group here um, was uh, physicians who had been treated for substance use disorders and uh, I was focused at their own outlook at their uh, physician work culture. So I researched on sp uh, specific sociocultural factors in the physician work culture uh, and interviewed um, these physicians about it and also had a literature study specifically focused at the development of substance use disorders and problematic substance use and also at uh, physicians management of their previous substance use uh, challenges and problems please change yes so the interviewees were surgeons medical doctors general practitioners and researchers and a short overview um, to you, the women, four, four of the participants were women, and one of them was a drug user, one was a medicine user, and non-alcohol users, actually. Eight were men uh, in the study, and five of these were alcohol uh, users, and no one drug users, and three were medicine users. And actually, this fits uh, quite well with the quantitative data, it's, it's often uh, women are doing more uh, medicine and, and other drugs and men uh, a, a little more likely to, do, to use uh, alcohol. All right, um, so the general findings from this studies was that the durability of the substance use disorders were uh, from six months to up to uh, 25 years. And the men were the ones who sought help at the latest time in their substance use disorders. The external help was initiated either because uh, the substance users were identified at their workplaces doing drugs uh, or doing uh, alcohol at work, or and, and then sent uh, to, um, to treatment uh, by the health uh, inspectors. And others um, would seek help through colleagues and leaders, but this was not very prevalent, actually. So please change. Yes. And the key points of the study um, is that substance use disorders is not a lifestyle choice. Rather, it's a loss of self-control and a loss of self-identification. Also, the physicians' uh, work culture and professional socialization can affect the development of pro problematic substance use. Um, and the last thing is that the uh, social technologies such as sanctions can actually affect problematic substance use in both intended but also unintended ways. And there is a dis disciplinary paradox that I will return to uh, in a minute. Yes, so the cultural influence uh, on the loss of, of self-control um, seemed through the interviews to be a, a product of a combination of hierarchical pressure and emotional strains in critical clinical situations. And I'll go me more into de detail with it in a minute. But the thing is that performance enhancing self-medication is, is part of, of a, the, the problem here in this setting. It's to control emotional strains in critical clinical situations, but it's also uh, often used uh, initially only periodical uh, if you, uh, uh, on single days, but then as the pressure uh, while climbing the career letter, ladder uh, uh, increases, uh, they also tend to um, to um, rise their uh, performance pressures and their uh, consumption of uh, substances. 
So there is um, a work, it's, it's a kind of work related coping strategy that then becomes a substance use uh, problem at a certain point. And uh, yeah, the, the dependence syndrome seems to result from an unconditional loss of self-control and self-identification. Please change. Yes. So which are then these uh, work-related strains? Uh, it may be the critical patient case, particularly cases of a strong identification. It may be if the physician, physician has a child him, himself that is of, of this equal age as the patient, or if um, the long-term relations to the patient somehow uh, affects uh, the, the physician. Some patients have been in contact with a specific uh, physician for half a life or something like that. So um, also um, organizational changes such as restructuration and financial cutdowns increased administrative pressure and efficiency improvements sometimes push uh, towards um, uh, extra substance uses to actually um, to, to uh, put, put up with the job and all the tasks. And also, of course, fear of making mistakes uh, professionally. And here I would like to, to um, give you an impression of a particular informant I, I interviewed. He was a surgeon and to me, he, he said, um, no one of the physicians will admit that they are afraid of operating. It is a physician's Hassan syndrome. We physicians can do everything. We are kind of megalomaniac. You cannot have a shaking hand if you operate a patient. You need to somehow get control of it. And it's quite easy, actually. You can take uh, beta blockers combined with benzodiazepines, and then you are kind of in control and your hand will not be shaking. And, and this, is the, this is actually why he started. He, he had to control his movements to an extreme extent in order to not cut uh, in the wrong places of the bodies he was operating on. So, so yeah, so there was, this was just to, to give you an impression of the material I, I have to please change now. Yes, so, but what do we do about uh, drug use at the workplaces? We have the social technologies and sanctions to actually try to direct and redirect uh, professional conduct. And this may be, uh, for instance, the physician law and also an ethical conduct codex for physicians. In Denmark, we have like seven physician roles that uh, kind of standardize the professional conduct for physicians. And it, this is a way to assure a quality standards. So, but then the, the, the sanctions are also part of this um, social technology um, and, and they are also meant to direct uh, the conduct uh, and redirect it. And these are the loss of authorization as a physician, the loss of prescription right, um, and then of course dependency syndrome treatment and urine controls. And then you can change again. So social technologies uh, by, um, are interpreted by the physicians and some of the physicians actually know very little about these social technologies. And then it creates fear uh, of the sanctions, fear of a total social deroute, loss of the job, loss of prestige, identity, and the ability to pro provide for oneself and for relatives. This may lead into a catastrophe thinking that I've met when I've interviewed these uh, physicians. They fear engagement in treatment very much, and they uh, prefer self-treatment to hide the problem from colleagues and treatment systems. So uh, alcohol consumers will self-treat with D uh, disulfiram, and they may stay in their substance abuse, uh, substance use disorders for 20 to 25 years while they are working as physicians uh, aside. 
And this is this is quite uh, serious. It it may have consequences for patients. Actually, Oreskowitz in 2012 reported that 78% of the medical mistakes um, reported were related to physicians' alcohol problems. Please change again. So yeah, and and there is also in the physician uh, work community a kind of covering up uh, of, of uh, physician colleagues who are in uh, substance use disorders. And this leads to a kind of non-intervention. And I was looking at uh, older studies in order to see where does this come from? Uh, and, and it seems that there is this ethical codex and Armstrong once pointed out that there is a kind of a brotherhood among physicians and that in this brotherhood, they tend to protect each others from strange from, for instance, patient complaints. And this leads to the covering up towards the outside because they know that mistakes will happen at some, some point and it can happen for everyone. And this is actually in a way a good thing, but it also leads to the non-intervention. It's not the only thing, and I will point to other things that, that point in, in, in the direction of non-intervention. Uh, but it, yeah, and that is, is actually the, the fact that it's seen as a private problem. You probably know that already, because I think it's quite a general thing that we view the consumption of alcohol and drugs by and large as a private problem. And this also makes it difficult to intervene for workplaces, actually. Please change. So, yeah, my conclusion, substance use disorders may be related to physician work culture. And physician work uh, settings um, include some emotional strain from patients and critical conditions, but also from work hierarchies, performance pressure, and competition among colleagues that might lead to um, a consumption of uh, both alcohol and drugs. And the reasons why alcohol and drugs are used uh, by these physicians uh, at, uh, at least twofold, performance enhancement, um, but also for relaxations, relaxation after stress, stressful situations at the job. Um, and um, yeah, this may then, as we have seen, lead to uh, the dependence uh, syndrome and result in an unconditional loss of uh, self-control and self-identification. Can you change again? Thank you. And uh, yeah, then I also wanted to return to the paradoxes. There is this paradox of the social te technologies that it are meant to standardize and assure quality, but they may have this adverse effect uh, and um, in actually uh, make physicians self-treat and avoid formal treatment systems. And also, um, yeah, make it, it, it difficult uh, for them to, to access the, the, the treatment systems because they really fear this total social derude, as I, I, I pointed to. Um, so yeah, the physician community will cover up as we just saw and uh, each other, and they will do that both uh, externally, but also internally because they see it as a private problem a moral problem that is not really uh, something that the workplace should uh, salute. So there is a tendency at the physician workplaces for non-intervention to be the most prevalent thing, unfortunately, but yeah. And um, it is quite risky actually, both for the patients, them the physicians themselves, because uh, they, they may harm their mental and physical health, but also for the, the patient's safety, of course. Can you change? Yes. So this leads me to come up with some recommendations. Uh, I would recommend an open dialogue at the, the workplaces, uh, a dialogue in which uh, it was mentioned also that the sanctions are not definitive, that uh, it's possible to enter anonymous treatment uh, also for health professionals and to make this very clear to everyone and also to 
uh, to make sure that um, that uh, physicians know that it's important to to intervene in in these uh, processes, um, both for the patients and for the physicians, and. Also, it would be important to mention to them that it's actually possible to regain the lost self-control and that 80% of the phys physicians who finalize treatment uh, return to work and stay there uh, at least five years after they have been uh, in treatment. So, so the results when they enter treatment are very good and we should actually stress this and stress also that it's possible to get reintegrated at a job afterwards. So, and also I, I recommend early intervention and I recommend that it is, is mentioned as a collegial responsibility a workplace responsibility to intervene in these things. And that uh, we really uh, stress that openness about substance use disorders and that it can uh, hit anyone uh, regardless of profession, um, it, it's really uh, important. Um, also, it's important at workplaces to have um, work, uh, to have alcohol and drug policies um, and they should be very clear to everyone. They should be mentioned every year. It's not something that should be hid hidden away. Yeah, I think this is actually all. And uh, yeah, so I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, it's been a pleasure. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Johanna. That was really, really interesting. And I'm sure it will elicit uh, some questions from the audience, which again, I will emphasize, you have a question and answers button at the bottom of your screen, and you may use that to include your questions that then we will address at the end of the presentations. So the next question is for Elizabeth Santos, and she'll be talking about what is being done to address the problems through a case study from Portugal. Hello, good morning. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the NCDDA for the invitation uh, to share with you our experience in designing and implementing a substance use prevention program in the workplace. Um, I will start by presenting you um, the focus and the principles of the program, as well as the aims that we have with our program, presenting you the healthcare team, and then sharing with you some of the design and implementation main questions. And I will finish by um, sharing some of the main challenges that we have faced throughout the process. So um, starting um, by the beginning, um, the, 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 the program is named Prevenir, which in Portuguese mean, means to prevent. Um, and this is because that really is our focus. We want to prevent substance use problems and negative consequences. It is not our aim to catch people or to punish them uh, for their uh, substance use. Um, and uh, substance use prevention programs should not, should not be about punishing, but instead uh, about preventing and providing the support needed uh, for treatment and recovery. So, the focus, um, first of all, is on health because we are um, a healthcare unit. But um, as we uh, work with um, workers that um, deal with a, a safety sensitive industry, we also have a focus on performance and as well on safety. And the, the, the major principles we are following are the ones um, presented by the Pompidou Group, which are responsibility, transparency uh, along the process, respect for collective and individual freedoms, as well as uh, the solidarity within working communities. As for the aims, uh, well, they differ according to the substance use 
um, experience uh, people have. So to all workers, we uh, our aim is to improve their health performance and security and safety as well. For those uh, at higher risk for substance misuse, the aim is to prevent substance misuse. And uh, at last, for those with substance use problems, the aim is to provide treatment of substance misuse and recovery. The healthcare um, team, well, the, this program is under the umbrella of Occupational Health and Safety Department. So our team integrates occupational health physicians, occupational health nurses, clinical psychologists, and psychiatrists. And they are the ones that um, provide treatment to workers with substance misuse. And now I would like to share some information about um, in design and implementation. So we started by having an agreement within the company as for these issues. And then we have to have the agreement by the unions as they are the entities responsible for um, work with, um, with the workers as well. And then we perform needs assessment in order to uh, know what kind of activities and what kind of working conditions should be targets as well. So um, based on this needs assessment, we started to work on some working conditions and I will afterwards um, share with you some information about each one of the implementation activities. Then after uh, making some improving in working conditions, we uh, have developed um, uh, a document um, for substance-free um, activities. So it's a policy, a company policy uh, for substance-free uh, substance -free workplace. And this document um, determines uh, some activities, namely awareness activities, as well as training and education activities, and at last, drug testing, counseling, and treatment. And the last, um, the last activity um, is evaluation of the program. So, um, as for improved working conditions, um, I, I have two. Um, I brought you two examples. One, a more broad example. Can you please change? for the next a more broad example, um, which is vending machines with uh, healthy snacks, healthier snacks. <laughs> so it's a more broad example uh, related with health um, improvement. And another one um, more specific for um, substance use, which is taking out alcoholic bev beverages from the canteen. So we don't have access to alcoholic beverages within the company. Well, um, about substance-free company documents, the policy uh, itself, it was um, based on national laws, as well as sectorial policies and contractual laws, and uh, as well as on several international guidelines that we had to take into account, namely the ones from International Labour Organization, the Pompidou Group, the MCDDA, uh, the European Workplace Group testing society so we uh, had we, we take we took into consideration all of these international guidelines when developing and designing the program uh, and as well as national guidelines from the data protection commission the um, general directorate for intervention on addictive behaviors and dependencies the portuguese health authority and as well as the portuguese authority for labor conditions well um now, the first, the first activities that we had really implemented was awareness activities. So we started implementing our program by delivering awareness activities. And within uh, these activities, we have uh, developed several materials that started to um, approach the subject on substance use as um, a health problem that has an impact on safety of everyone. And uh, that's the reason why um, companies started to implement measures to prevent and to control as well uh, substance use within the workplace. So uh, we also developed in materials for each substance that were uh, addressed within the, the company policy. You can give one click. 
that one is translated to English. So we provided several, uh, I think, useful information about the intended effects and the unintended effects of substance use and the negative consequences um, within familiar and professional um, areas of uh, a worker's life. We also provided some questions that people could use to self-assess whether they have a problem or not with that substance in particular. And all of these um, materials were sending, uh, were sent to, to all workers by email and disseminated in the company communication channels like internet. And they all were made available afterwards for people to um, be able to uh, consult uh, afterwards. So when we finished awareness information, we started with drug um, with education and training, and we have developed uh, two activities. The first one was an e-learning um, activity that was um, considered mandatory to all supervisors and voluntary to all other employees. Uh, the purpose was to inform uh, about the company's substance-free policy and the workplace program, and as well as to provide information on, on substances and substance use. And we had several contents um, related with the company policy, the workplace program, the substance use warning signs, prevention and treatment as well. And the second um, activity was an on-site training that uh, was considered mandatory as well for supervisors, managers, directors, and other kinds of um, uh, people with uh, responsibilities within the company. Uh, the, purpose, the purpose was to work um, abilities to make referrals to the, health to the health services whenever needed. And we... Um, approach um, contents such as stereotypes, prevalence of substance use in the workplace, warning signs, the supervision, uh, supervision's role, and the referral uh, to the health services. And it was uh, only after training was completed that we started to undertake drug testing, counseling, and treatment. And I will share um, some information with you about the procedure. So. Um, Screening tests, um, we started to do after training and uh, it's a random screening tests. And whenever there is a negative result, the worker returns to duty. Whenever there is a non-negative result, there is a, a counter-analysis that is made. And if the counter-analysis is negative, the worker returns to duty. But if the counter-analysis is positive, um, they will get retested in another certified laboratory. If the result is negative, they will return to duty. But if the result is positive, they will be sent to a medical review. They will be considered and fit to duty and they will integrate the program, the treatment, um, the treatment, the treatment program. So um, whenever there is a positive result, um, workers get in the program. They can also uh, get in the program through self-referral or um, if um, their supervisor considers that there is a problem with the performance and they are um, referral to the health services and a screening test, test is done and it's positive. So when this kind of situations uh, arise, um, they get in the program, they are going to be assessed through um, by each one of the professionals, so a physician, a nurse, a psychologist, and a psychiatrist, and we perform a diagnosis. So if the diagnosis is of non-problematic use, there is um, a therapeutic contract that is signed and the worker is under follow-up for six months and they have to perform uh, several screening tests. If all the screening tests are negative, they will have a clinical discharge. If the diagnosis is for abuse or dependency, there is as well as a therapeutic contract being signed. The person, the worker can choose, uh, well, the, the treatment is voluntary and they can choose whether they have inpatient treatment or outpatient treatment, but they will always have the follow-up, the monitoring with us. And after 24 months of negative tests um, and a positive um, opinion of all the, the professionals, they will have a clinical discharge. 
So we get to evaluation. Um, we perform two kinds of evaluation as suggested by the MCDDA. So we have a process evaluation, which is about implementation of the program, the quality and usefulness of the program, uh, the reach and coverage, the acceptance, the implementation fidelity and the use of resources. And we also have an outcome evaluation that is about the effects of intervention, uh, in accomplishment with aims and the need to adapt or discard some activities. And I brought um, some examples uh, for you. So uh, as for the process, the, no, the number of workers, the worker satisfaction with training, the number of screening tests, the number of workers under treatment, and for the outcomes, um, the abstinence durability, the number of dropouts, the number of clinical discharges, etc. And I have three um, real examples to share with you. So as for the e-learning, uh, here you have um, the score um, accomplished by the end of the learning, and we have 93% of workers that finish the learning with um, a classification higher than 90%. So, uh, because they are assessed uh, along the the e-learning training, so I think it's a very good result. Uh, people really absorb the contents. As for the onset training, um, we have we have assessed in the beginning of the session uh, the stereotypes that supervisors have on uh, substance users, and we can see that fifty nine percent of supervisors had negative stereotypes of substance abusers, and at the end of the session, um, the number dropped to twelve. 12%, so 88% ended up the session with positive stereotypes about substance users. So we can conclude that, um, click, 47% of supervisors uh, have changed their negative stereotypes on substance users. And at last, um, uh, one result on counseling and treatment. So um, we have um, under treatment 10% at the moment, 72.9% uh, of uh, workers that completed treatment requirements and were clinical discharge, 13% that were dismissed, and 3% uh, that deceased, unfortunately. So uh, main challenges um, from our experience, as for, I brought one uh, for each uh, of the activities. So as for the awareness and information, our main challenge was to access uh, the information to, F, to give us access to information by workers in remote locations. Um, as for education training, to motivate supervisors, managers and directors to enroll on on-site training. As for the screening test, the main challenge was to screen workers in night shifts and for counseling and treatment to motivate workers in denial for treatment. So uh, you have my contact. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm uh, available to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we already have some questions at the questions and answer and also in the chat. Um, I would start actually with, with uh, a question from Fleur to William and Anik. We, William had to, to leave earlier, so it will be for Anik. And Fleur is saying, there are, are there any EUI data on the links between bullying, violence, and in particular, gendered violence and assaults related to substance use in the work settings? This would be especially interesting given the associations that have been finally getting more attention between alcohol and domestic violence in high competition social settings like sports events. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, it's not uh, directly possible to, to, to make this link, but I think maybe at a more, at a higher level, we could see some, uh, some parallels in here. But I think for sure it's very, uh, useful to look at the situational aspects within a company, for example, where there's a lot of fragmented work or no direct supervisor available, and to see the link if, if link between them. <coughs> sorry, the link between um, the drug prevention programs. So there could be an interesting link, but it's not that directly available, unfortunately. 
but um, yeah, we can try <laughs> to get as close as possible. Thank you. There has been some questions also about the testing and the testing programs. Uh, someone has asked about who pays these tests and whether the workers are um, aware that they can be tested. So, and Fleur again was wondering if you could mention some key points about the use of substance use testing in programs to reduce use. I suppose this is a question that all three of the speakers can can uh, answer in a way. Perhaps Elizabeth, would you like to, to tell us something from Prevenir? Okay. Uh, so the company pays the tests. Okay. Um, it's uh, it's um, regulated by law in Portugal. So the company should pay for the tests, the screening tests and the counterproof as well. Um, the next question was whether workers were aware of the, that they could be tested, and they are, uh, they have to be, uh, and that's why we started with awareness um, activities. We started to talk about the program and to uh, communicate the kind of activities that were going to be undertaken, so people do know that they uh, can be tested. The, um, the, the, the policy document is available on the internet so that all uh, workers can access and read the document. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Johanna and Anik, is there something that you would like to add? No? Okay. Um, can I ask you also, just because we're, we're still on this point, Elizabeth, if you think that there has been, if you notice that there, there is any correlation or causal effect between being aware that tests can be made and, and drug use, for instance, because the evidence has been pointing that, well, currently there is no evidence of such uh, causal relationship. So we were wondering as well how employees um, take or what they think about the possibility of being tested? Well, we have a really specific reality uh, because um, we work with uh, companies that is mandatory for them to test their workers. So um, I think there is a general culture within the companies that uh, people have to comply with drug testing. It's a matter of safety for them, as well as for the clients of the companies. And um, I, I can share with you that it was difficult uh, for the companies to implement the program until um, while it was not mandatory, because we are talking about a sensitive subject that has, that has to do with individual freedom, um, and we had to uh, think about the way we tested people in a way that we can accomplish with the requirements, okay, as well as to respect individual freedom. Um, and I think we've managed to do that through the kind of tests we do, um, because we can use several kinds of tests with different um, time detection windows. Um, and so I think that within our reality, workers, they do comply with uh, drug screening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Welcome. Uh, I believe Marika compiled a few questions as well from, from the chat. Yes. So there is a question for Joanna. Um, saying that it is very important to recognize that uh, being a medical doctor, a physician can be a very stressful profession and not only in the workplace, because quite often they are the reference point for also for families and friends. So they are under continuous uh, uh, pressure. Um, the question is, do you know if there are any self-help groups to manage stress in, in, in place? If, these are experience beyond using or not substances, just to manage 
yes. the stress related to this profession. Yeah, there is in Denmark a, a network of uh, physicians where they can come and uh, and speak anonymously to each other about uh, work related to challenges. So, so it is is it it is a possibility to to access a, a network uh, both online but also in in some cases in physical meetings. Um, so, so there is. Uh, and offer for them so, sort of, but it, I think it's not all physicians that actually know about it. So yeah. there are still challenges uh, in that sense uh, of, of spreading it out and uh, and then making it, it work. And also the, the physicians have a, a special uh, challenge because they know that colleagues might read their electronic uh, patient uh, uh, documents, right, yes. you know, so uh, so that is also a, a strain and a, a pullback if in in, uh, in relation to actually uh, seeking treatment. Uh, so they, so they really fear that that if they enter into some kind of of treatment, but also maybe we have these networks somebody may get to know and then it will spread within the collegial uh, community and then they are uh, uh, finalized as a physician so re they really feel this social uh, the root uh, it, it's a, a big thing for the ones who have been in substance use disorders thank yeah. you thank you very much there is another question it was for william but i understood he had to left to leave so uh, i i ask uh, this question to a nick and is, you mentioned two main reasons for using substances in the work environment. One is to manage stress and the other is to manage pain and fatigue. Uh, the question is, is there any pleasure component as it was for smoking cigarettes or, or having a glass of wine uh, during food? Do you have any data about this, Anik from OSHA? Well, we don't have such a specific data. Uh, but I think what was interesting with this uh, stress factors like bullying is the chicken and egg uh, perspective that we also don't know uh, if you are working in a, uh, in a fragile situation, it can be a trigger factor for using drugs. But on the other hand, if you're in an uncomfortable working situation at work, um, it, it can also be the drugs that, that, that is your kind of medicine you think to be able to perform as well. Um, so it works like in two ways, but unfortunately there are no, there are no data available at that detail level. This is a, an invitation to build together. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I can add here, uh, because I actually asked uh, in the survey, I asked people why they were using substances. And I think the majority actually uh, in the study was saying that they that it was to uh, to enjoy the, the taste of the alcohol or to to be in a good mood and, and, and stuff like that. So, so it, of course, is widespread also uh, that, that this, is a, this is an argument and this uh, is, is a reason for, for consuming the substances. And also relaxation, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, is, is a, a great thing. And, and it's, it's also kind of relaxation from stressful work and stuff like that, yeah. so. So there are indications of positive uh, effects too. I move to another question for Elisabete, and it is about, uh, you are also an expert in, in prevention overall. Can you, do you highlight any difference, main differences between prevention, for example, in school and prevention in the workplace? You are mute. I used to say that um, workplaces are for adults and schools are for children. <laughs> um, and well, I think the main difficulty and, and it's um, shared by schools and um, workplaces is to understand the um, poor efficacy of some strategies, namely the more informative ones campaigns to uh, share information on substances are proved to be ineffective. Um, and I think that message is not uh, really um, 
disseminated, really disseminated um, and absorbed by uh, schools and workplaces. Um, so I, I think that there is um, a share <laughs> difficulty across both uh, contexts of intervention. But I think the workplaces are really, really um, useful um, contexts to work with adults that otherwise we would miss. Thank you very much. There is a, still one other question from you, and is about, uh, you mentioned some change between negative and, and positive stereotypes about drugs after your intervention about your drugs use after your intervention. Could you make an example? Is there any statement or behavior that may have changed? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so uh, we asked, um, this was a free activity. So uh, we, we gave um, a piece of paper to all of uh, supervisors and asked them to write an opinion they have on substance abusers. And we had things like uh, substance abusers are weak people, they are not productive. And we, um, we, we did the same at the end of the session. We gave them a piece of paper and asked them to write um, what they think about after the session about substance abusers. And they wrote things such as um, substance abusers have a, a chronic illness, uh, substance abusers are people that need treatment, so uh, that was the way we used to address um, the stereotypes within supervisors. Okay, thank you for the, for the examples about people who use uh, substances. Um, there is another question asking, I, I, I think this is more or less for everybody, that is about drug testing, asking the time frame. Uh, the question is about the fact that if someone uses uh, substances in their spare time and then they are tested when the, the substance is still, still in, in the half-life, it, it results positive, but it's not positive while working. Um, do you have any comments about this question? Well, I, I, I thought, I, thought um, I talked about this question um, previously when I was saying that it's, we have to balance between um, workplaces, companies' right to um, check whether the workers are in the right condition to perform and uh, balance it with um, individual rights and freedom to do whatever workers want to do on their free time. And the, um, the way that we have managed to balance was through the kind of tests we use. So we can use different uh, tests that give us information for different time frames. If we test on hair, hair we will have a longer time frame depending on the the length of the hair, but um, we don't use it. Uh, we use saliva, which is the, um, the test that gives us the smallest window. And, and the reason is exactly to um, show that we are not uh, testing the day before or two days before or the weekend or the, the day off. We are testing that, that day. It yes. was the best we could do. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. There is another, but I think it's a comment uh, rather than an answer, a question that is about um, the fact that in some schools there is an environmental uh, uh, policy for the students, but not also for the staff members. If I recall correctly, with the work uh, with uh, Gregor Burkhardt, who is our expert on prevention, and with you also, when we talk about um, environmental policies, we talk about the entire environment. So whoever enters into the school, not only students or, or teachers. Can you confirm? Is uh, do I recall well? <laughs> I take it as a, a yes. <laughs> so. Um, I think we can go towards a conclusion if uh, any of the speakers would like to, to add something. 
I'm not as good as our director to do to draw conclusions, and I not even attempt. Uh, I limit myself to to hear and and to highlight something that you all said, and I think has also is in common with the the environment in treatment, for example, where it is in the common interest to minimize the stigma around this behavior, to remain with a neutral and, and, and open uh, uh, mindset in a way that people is, is uh, asking for help when they need, and the respect of the dignity of individual is absolutely uh, maintained. I, I heard this across all uh, your presentations, and I think is also in the recommendations that, that, that exist uh, at the moment by several international organizations and are mentioned in, the, in the, our mini guide. So after having said that, I would invite our audience to have a look at the mini guide to remain in contact with us. And also, I, I really thank you the speakers, uh, my colleagues, Inesh, uh, for having chaired this session, Alessandra also identified you <laughs> as the speakers, and, uh, and thank you, uh, everybody. I will uh, still uh, launch a little poll for our audience to tell us if they liked, if it was too long, too short, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the invitees can go. You are not uh, uh, obliged to remain. I will keep the session open still for a while to give people time to reply to the poll and also because it's not, never very nice to be kicked off <laughs> the webinar. Thank you, everybody. See you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.